Hey guys, the Raid Shadow Legends campaign is still going, so if you would like to help contribute, please click the referral link below to install the game and try it out. If you do, you will help me complete the campaign, and then when we complete it, I'll start working on another massive 40-minute video for you guys as a recompense for the help. It really would mean a lot to me if we could get the campaign completed, so thank you very, very, very much. Before we get started, I do want you all to know that there will be no spoilers for Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden here. There are real spoilers out there if you know where to look, but you will not find them here. I do not know anything about the adventure, so technically I can't spoil anything. Do keep in mind though that we will be talking about the Frost Maiden, which is a character with a bit of backstory from older books, previous adventures, novels, and source books. If you want to be absolutely blind to who this character is or what the implications of her being here might be then then you probably shouldn't watch this video otherwise again know that no actual adventure spoilers will be presented here because again i don't know what's in the book or what is the plot of the book so but yeah here we go some of you already know, but the Frost Maiden is one of many titles currently being held by Oral, Goddess of Winter. So this video is really about Oral, one of the members of the Gods of Fury, a collection of chaotic deities under the protection and rulership of Talos, God of Destruction. We will cover that group of gods in a minute because they are important, but first, who is this Frost Maiden? According to Fates and Pantheons, quote, Oral is a fickle, vain, evil deity with a heart of ice who is venerated primarily out of fear. She remains untouched by any hint of true love, noble feeling, or honor. She enjoys toying with those who offend her, trapping them in snowstorms, and then driving them insane with tantalizing visions of warmth and the comforts of home before freezing them to death. Her beauty is cold and deadly, the flower of womanhood preserved forever in a slab of arctic ice, with sensibilities to match the ice." End quote. In essence, she is the chaotic evil goddess of winter. She is typically portrayed as a beautiful blue-skinned maiden in a mantle of white. Her favorite weapon, which she always wields to combat, is a mysteriously cold ice battle axe called Ice Maiden's Caress, an incredibly powerful plus three frost brand battle axe. This form, however, is merely one of her two most popular avatars. It is in fact this one, the one that we call the Frost Maiden, and just how the name implies, it's supposed to be a, a beautiful woman of ice. Because her abilities actually do change depending on which form she takes, this is the form that would be considered her combat form. While in this Frost Maiden avatar, she's considered to be a level 27 mage, a level 20 fighter, and a level 15 cleric all in one for the purposes of spells and abilities, so very, very powerful. While in this form, she can cast all spells known as long as they are not fire-based and as long as they can hurt and harm animals and plants. If the spell has the ability to harm a plant or an animal and it's not fire, she can basically cast it. She also has the ability to cast any spell that has to do with light, except that she casts them reversed. So instead of casting the light cantrip and produce a ball of light, for example, she can instead produce a ball of darkness with that cantrip. So her power to produce darkness is actually very strong. Further, all cold spells she produces come out at triple damage and with a minus three penalties to all saving throws against resisting them. Her other form is called Ice Dawn, and it is described as, quote, a silent, blinding apparition of Icy Hatur, an impassable figure in an ornate crown and hooked, spurred armor of pale, light blue ice, end quote. This form is more of a bizarre, spectral form that she uses for traveling and inspiring fear on her enemies, but it's a special form because she cannot cast spells while in it. On the flip side though, she gains some considerable powers and abilities while she is in this form. For starters, she can reflect all priest and wizard spells of 6th level or less, back to their sources. Wherever she goes and whatever she passes freezes solid. Plants are automatically killed unless they are sentient, in which case they have to survive a saving throw or be put into a forced hibernation. Other living beings that come within 20 feet of this form must save or die by being frozen solid. Armor and other things made of metal become so naturally cold that they are literally painful to the touch. Water completely freezes solid, including other liquids like potions, which get completely destroyed in her presence. Metals and stone within 20 feet of her become shield and brittle. They shatter 20% of the time if dropped or struck with an attack. 
magical items or constructs are forced to also make a saving throw or literally be shattered and broken. So as you can see, even if she can't really cast spells in this form, this thing is dangerous. Oral does have a third avatar form, but it is mostly used to convey messages or to appear to a cleric of her order. So this would be the avatar that she would use if there was no danger to her person, or if she didn't mean to fight. This shape appears as an icy breath accompanied by a cold, ruthless shockling and a blue-white radiance that leaves a thin line of frost to mark her passage. People have also seen her as a blank-eyed face of frost, with long, wind-whipped white hair that radiates intense cold. If she wishes to punish someone or simply slay a person that will not be able to fight back, she appears in this form and simply kisses the person, which instantly kills the person. If she wishes to confer a boon to a person, she will blow air in this manner into the face of the hero to grant it power. Now, kisses do seem to be a recurring theme with Oral. This comes from the Sword Coast Adventure Guide, quote, Luskin has a temple dedicated to Oral, the white-spired Winter Palace. The structure is a roofless array of pillars and arches carved of white stone. The rituals of Oral's worship often seem cruel to outsiders. In Luskin, visitors gather at the temple to watch the frequent wet parades, a ritual in which supplicants don garments packed with eyes. They then journey between six white pillars known as the Kisses of Oral, which are dispersed throughout the city. The worshippers move from pillar to pillar, chanting prayers to the goddess. Upon reaching a pillar, a supplicant must climb it and then kiss the lady, touching lips to a rusty iron plate at the top. In winter, these events resemble frantic foot races, with the added risk of frostbite and injuries caused by falling from the slippery pillars. The parade runners are cheered on by patrons who come out of the nearby taverns to place bets on the stamina of the participants. Those who finish the race are thought to have helped make the winter easier, and they rarely have to pay for food or ale all winter long." End quote. I do want to point out, though, that her clerics do not kiss other people. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Priests of Oral take a vow of celibacy, so kissing strangers is generally out of the question. If you find clerics of Oral in Icewind Dale, you won't be able to flirt with them, unfortunately. But now, how does she relate to Icewind Dale? So Icewind Dale is a region far to the north, completely separated and walled off by a massive mountain range called the Spine of the World. As you can see from the map, they are basically as far north as you can be in a land that is cold and snowy for the entirety of the year. In this place, winters are brutal, to the point where during winter, you literally cannot travel away from Icewind Dale because the whole passage through the mountain becomes completely blocked off. Because of how brutal winter is in here, many people fear and respect Oral for she has the power to make the winters tamer or stronger if she so wished. Oral is not the type of god that seeks prayer with a comforting hand. Instead, she threatens for obedience and offerings. If you do not give proper offerings, she will make sure that winter is particularly bad for you and those that you care for. And with this mantra, she has managed to keep a sizable chunk of the inhabitants of Icewind Dale under her control. Many of her priests walk the streets literally threatening people that if they don't offer gold, Oral will personally make their life hell this winter. And the thing is, those threats are actually real. The stories are everywhere of Oral singling out a person and just waiting for them to leave the city in order to torment them with a blizzard and kill them. See, Oral has a lot of vested interest in Icewind Dale and places just like this to venerate her because, frankly, there aren't many places like Icewind Dale in the world. See, out there in the cold, icy front of the north, you mostly find monsters, white dragons, and frost giants. I mean, that's it. None of which are that great as supplicants. Monsters because they're not smart enough to understand the concept of a deity. Dragons because they are secular, so they don't believe in, they don't really pray to gods. And giants because they venerate their own giant gods. Some giants do follow Oral, but she can't quite threaten them in the same way as she can humans, so they're not as useful to her. Now, Icewind Dale is special because it is filled with humans who are prone to prayer, unlike the humans who are found in the Great Glacier further to the east, because those humans over there are almost completely secular and will not pay any attention to any deity, so she can't really threaten them. 
The good folk in Icewind Dale, though, oof, they just get spooked easily by threats and will give her offerings if she threatens enough. Now, many people don't know this, but at the beginning of 5th edition, before 5th edition was actually finished, we had a mini-adventure that was never fully published called The Legacy of the Crystal Shard. The story was meant to be a partial continuation to a couple of the D&D novels, but in the adventure you travel to Icewind Dale and in there you actually do get to interact with Oral quite a bit. This is Hedron Arnsfirth, the Chosen of Oral. So, a Chosen is essentially what it sounds like, a person that was chosen by a god to be almost like a mortal representation of that deity. That person basically becomes a demigod, or at least obtains powers similar to that of a demigod and then furthers the agenda of that god. Think of being a Chosen like being a level 30 cleric of a particular god. The god sees in you something that they really really want and then boom, you become blessed with a ton of power from that deity. Now, Hedron was a member of the tribe of the Elk, one of the many groups of nomadic barbarians that live in the area of Icewind Dale. Oral must have seen something in her, for she blessed her and turned her into her chosen, and further commanded her to punish the good people of Icewind Dale. See, Oral wanted to convert all ten settlements of the area into her personal dominion, so Hedron Arnsforth gathered a large army of animals and monsters and started attacking these settlements. Eventually she was killed by adventurers and we didn't really get to hear more of her. Simply that was the end of the adventure. However, a small plot twist ensued. In the book Tales of the Yawning Portal, under the adventure Dead in Thay, you actually find out that the body of Hedron somehow survived as an undead white and was further taken and imprisoned in the mega dungeon somewhere underneath Thay. In there, they were basically attempting to remove and absorb her divine essence, the, the chosen magic given to her, and so they kept her prisoner. Though thing is, if Dead in Thay as an adventure is canon, then one could surmise that at the end of the adventure she was probably released, or at least her chains would have been destroyed upon the adventurers defeating the bad guy in the dungeon, so it's not impossible that she could return to Icewind Dale as the Chosen of Oral to further complete her mission and take over the Ten Settlements. Another thing that you should probably keep in mind too if you decide to walk around in Icewind Dale pissing off this goddess is that she actually has a very strong allegiance to Umberly. So we talked about it before how Oral belonged to this group of chaotic gods. In that group you also have Umberly, Malor and Talos. Umberly and Oral get together really well for whatever reason, to the point where out of all of them, Oral feels like she can always call upon Umberly for help and that she will respond in kind. Further, there are many gifts that Umberly has given to Oral that relate to the sea, which means it is entirely possible that the sea of moving eyes could be under the control or power of Oral. Now that could come in handy. Now the lore also states that Talos will also heed a request for help, but she seldom asks for it because Talos tends to always get all the glory for whatever he does, leaving none to Oral. Now, Malor and Oral do not get along, like at all. You will never see either of them ever asking for help from the other. Now, in any case, if you ever seek to attack Oral in her own divine kingdom, you should be afraid of Umberly as well, for she will probably defend her. They're both really good friends, it seems. Now, Oral's realm is currently set in the Deep Wilds, the magical realm of Sylvanus, greater god of nature. She used to reside in a realm called Fury's Heart, which was Talos's domain, but we're not really Really sure what happened to the relationship between Talos and Oral, or really whatever happened to Talos in general. What we do know is that the realm of Fury's heart was torn apart during the spell plague and Malor, Umberly, and Oral all moved over to the deep wilds, but we don't actually know where Talos is anymore since he didn't move to deep wilds and Fury's heart was allegedly absorbed by Grumsh, greater god of orcs. I read in the forums that some people were saying that in 4th edition there were actually trying to get rid of Talos as a character in an effort to remove the number of gods in the pantheons and so they made it so that Talos was actually Grumsh in disguise the whole time. If you look at the Forgotten Realms campaign guide for 4th edition you will literally see that you can't find Talos anywhere on the book so they really did just delete him. But then when you read 5th edition you see him there as if nothing happened. You know 4th edition is weird they try to do so many weird things that 5th edition just 
just got rid of. Point is, we're not really sure if there even is a Gods of Fury anymore, or, or what is the relationship between Oral and Talos, but hey, maybe we can ask Oral in the next adventure. Regardless, in the Deep Wilds, Oral's castle is called Winter's Hall, and it is a massive floating fortress made out of air and ice. This is from Dungeon Magazine number 367, quote, Like a severe winter storm, Oral's Winter Hall moves slowly across the Deep Wilds, bringing strong winds and heavy blowing snow wherever it passes. Built on wind and ice, the structure seems as if it's carved from a massive iceberg, flipped on its end and thrust hundreds of leagues into the sky. The palace is nearly 5,000 feet in diameter at its base and an equal number of feet high at its summit, with a labyrinthine maze of corridors, halls and passages inside it. With nearly 20,000 damned spirits and immortal servitors dwelling within it at any given time, Winter Hall is easily the size of a small city. Immense crystalline beams protrude from the shell of the hall in several locations. Massive in size, these crystal spires give the otherwise drab fortress some color which ranges from deep royal blue to sea green. Much of the colossal ice moat is shrouded in a perpetual miasma of thick fog and freezing rain. If Oral is particularly angry, fierce cerulean thunderclouds form over the hall, bringing merciless blizzard conditions upon the lands below. Winter Hall as a physical structure is an amalgamation of varied styles that has undergone continual expansion over the millennia. Secreted away in the bowels of Winter Hall is Oral's grand throne room, Amon Tirir, the Lyceum of Frozen Shadow. The Lyceum is a grand and intimidating place which is by design. When she manifests in the hall, Oral broods or holds court from her throne of blue fire. She appears as a haughty winged fairy of terrible cold beauty, with bone white skin and angular features. End quote. Now you might be asking yourself, wait, she appears as a winged fairy? Is, is that her real form? So this is pretty interesting by the way. So the symbol of Oral, the goddess of winter, used to be a snowflake with a diamond background. That was her symbol for both 2nd and 3rd edition, as you can see. Now, what's interesting is that the symbol of the Queen of Air and Darkness, the evil sister of Queen Titania, ruler of the Fae, is a black diamond. Now, we typically don't hear much of the Queen of Air and Darkness. Not many people know what she's ever up to, especially since she is a god with a trickery domain. You know, a, a god that tricks people. <laughs> Now, the allusion that you probably see a mile away that I'm suggesting here is that the Queen of Air and Darkness and Oral are either related or are the same, and you might think, hey, that's crazy. Except that it is correct, or at least it was for a bit. In 4th edition, it was revealed that indeed, they were both the same. But then in 5th edition, we saw them as both two different entities. At least we saw them described as if they were two different entities. See, this is Oral's symbol in 5th edition. You can see that they specifically removed the diamond from the background and made it just a snowflake. However, when you see the art here of what I assume is the Queen of Air and Darkness, you can see a tremendous amount of icy flame layer to her, which is suspicious. Now, I actually don't know if this is supposed to be the Queen of Air and Darkness or just a, a normal warlock that they're supposed to be representing here. So if it is just a normal warlock, then yeah, scratch that. Point is, this particular topic was brought up to Ed Greenwood, creator of the Forgotten Realms, and he responded with, quote, The deeds of gods are often mysteries to mortals, especially when overlaid by what priesthoods say, which is often propaganda or misdirection intended to make their deities seem important or vital. In this case, I'd say this. The queen of air and darkness still claims to be oral to retain worshippers in Toral is exactly what is happening and Oral cooperates because it boosts her importance and therefore worship and therefore influence." End quote. So turns out they are both different entities altogether, but the Queen of Air and Darkness, the evil fake queen, sometimes likes to moonlight as Oral, and hey, I don't know, but owl bears look pretty fey to me. It's, it's all I'm saying. We're also back to using the diamond behind the snowflake, so even more suspicious. 
Anyways, let's just cover a, a bit on clerics and priests of Aural, since you might want to know some of this stuff if you plan on heading to Icewind Dale anytime soon. Most clergy of the Frost Maiden are female, probably because that's the way Aural likes it. See, in order to become a priest of Aural, you have to pass a wild test, a test called the Embrace. In this test, which can be done at any time of the year, you're supposed to go either high up in a mountain or to the far north and find yourself a blizzard. You're expected to survive an entire night through a blizzard in nothing but boots, a very thin set of clothes, and markings on your body depicting sacred symbols of Aural. You either perish in the task or survive, and if you survive, you are accepted as a priest and given your spells. Those that are accepted are rescued from the cold, from the pain, and from the shivering by the goddess, and from that point on are granted immunities to natural cold, so that from that day forth you will never suffer again the detrimental effects of cold, wind, and snow. Now, magic, cold, will still hurt you, but as far as natural cold goes, you could sleep under a blanket of snow all night long and you will not feel a thing. This ability is in fact so powerful that clerics of Oral are incredibly valuable to communities far north for they are the best equipped to run errands through the snow. Many priests of Oral become rich simply transporting things from village to village in the far reaches of the north, and because of this you will always be able to tell who is a priest of this goddess by the fact that they will typically wear summer attire in the middle of winter and they will never see themselves be bothered by it. In order to contact Oral, these priests must find the coldest place accessible to them, whether it is snow or a cold river, and submerge themselves partially on it, then close their eyes. Oral will then send them whatever instructions you would want to send them through mind visions. As far as activities, midwinter night is the most holy time of the year for them, and during this night they form a grand festival of ice dancing that lasts the whole night through. During this festival, the goddess desires her clergy to both enjoy themselves and to lure as many folk as possible into her service. And then as far as day-to-day -day activities, the main job of a priest of Oral is to make all folk fear the goddess through the fury of the winter weather. They will threaten people that if they don't offer money, Oral will make winter particularly bad. And through this, the priests become rich. Often the priests are expected, however, to part with at least a portion of their wealth by throwing it into rolling snow was an offering to the goddess. And then, during particularly bad winters, Oral beseeches her priests to convince other folk to perform what is called the cold cleansing, which is a prayer where a person will grab a piece of ice larger than a hand, and then they are supposed to press it against their exposed flesh until it melts. This must be done outside and at night. Prayers like these are what calms Oral from creating terrible winters, other than monetary offerings, of course. Now, many times what these priests use as their focus for casting spells and such is the ceremonial ice axe, just how the Frost Maiden avatar of Aurel uses in the pictures. So when it comes to the uh, literal day-to-day -day attire of these clerics, they are carrying those axes around, which is interesting to see. Now, there are many, and I mean many oral specific spells that she can either grant or she herself would use. Too many for me to actually describe here. This goes from literally being able to create cold fire, to shattering metals and stone with coldness, to draining the temperature around a large area around you. The spell I really like though that I wanted you guys to see is called Heart of Ice. A 7th level spell, alteration and necromancy, touch based with a permanent permanent duration permanent because you die. <laughs> the spell requires intense concentration and can only be delivered by touch, requiring a successful attack roll to deliver on any but totally immobilized opponents. Victims turn black, are covered by a thin sheen of white frost, and instantly begin to shiver uncontrollably. Victims must make a successful saving throw versus death magic or die as their hearts freeze and shatter. It's a spell that if they literally touch you once the spell is ready, then you just die. But yeah, that is Oral, the Frost Maiden. She is currently fairly weak according to the lore since Talos absorbed a great deal of power from her. And because of that, well, winters have been 
getting longer and colder as she attempts to take a stronger grasp on the areas that are weak to her dominion. This is why she sent her chosen to deal with Icewind Dale and is why she is not going to stop. And is why she probably is doing something crazy now in Icewind Dale, but I guess we will have to see what exactly that is in the next adventure. I am very curious. Overall, you should probably expect that this is going to be another adventure with cultists. We're probably going to see a lot of clerics and priests of Oral that are basically going to behave like cultists, trying to uh, threaten people into venerating her. And then, if we ever do get to meet her, it'll probably not. Go it's not going to be. It's just not going to be a fun and nice interaction. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters Walker, Motley, Zach Bowell, Rucato Fan, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doc Feeder, Terry Culp, Barakas Law, Omega Scales, Karathas the Bulwark, Ozol, Soundtech, Ziri, Alex Cookson, Square Chicken, Ariel Nelson, Benjamin Bosters, IO is Awesome, Falky951, Jacob Krasid, Griffin Pierce, Ziran King, Brad Salazar, Sabine Kurjab, Solarensis, Ordoric, Tesla Coil, Michael S, Prince Daylight Morning Crown, William Sladden, Drayden, Troll Skull Dude, Mr. Salty, Adam A, Silent Shoppa, The Role Playing Junkies Podcast, Thomas Hunt, and Jericho Darkstar for supporting me on Patreon at the 25 dollar level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head over to patreon.com slash Mr. Rex to support. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'd like to remind you once again to please please subscribe and click that like button and of course leave me a comment on what type of video you want to see next which individual god or monster you want me to talk about and i'll try and do that but with that said guys thank you so much for watching and i'll see you all next time Bye bye